Hi there, thanks for joining us. Today I am speaking with Rajiv Jain, who is the Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager at GQG Partners. Rajiv, you quite humbly call yourself a Portfolio Manager. You're probably a little bit more than that, given that you've founded the organisation. But I suppose yeah. uh, it's important to still have your hands on the lever in terms of uh, portfolio investment decisions, given how fluid the markets are at the moment. Yeah, I think, I think uh, as you rightly said, this is a business where you have to be in the trenches. Um, and, but that's where the fun part is too, because markets are constantly in a flux and opportunities come from different areas. So that's my passion. I love, you know, that's, that's what I do and uh, I enjoy it. Rajiv, obviously your personality and your uh, philosophies are important in the organization. You're the founder, but I suppose the point that um, we've been um, discussing off camera that you know, you're just one part of this organization and that the investment process is subjected to quite um, a rigorous conversation before anything happens. Yeah, so as you know, every decision we take goes through a PM committee. So the number of other PMs and the portfolio, the, 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 managers. The portfolio yeah. managers and the team, and there's some names I don't particularly love, but they have a stronger opinion than that. And that, that is also sort of, you know, is fed by a, quite a, a diverse team in terms of, we, as you know, we have former investigative journalists, number of them which did a lot of work on like energy and tech and which helped us selling tech was actually a lot of non-traditional work, uh, forensic accountants, long short credit, so on and so forth. So all, everything goes up into the committee and that really sort of, uh, makes the more robustness of the process over the long run. That sounds like there's a lot of people in a room for a long period of time. Uh, does that labor the investment decision um, or does it make it more effective when you've got so many voices contributing to it? Yeah, it's, it makes it more effective because we don't have silos. A lot of, lot of firms have specialists. The problem with specialists is that they don't talk to each other, yeah. right? So it's a fairly small team uh, in the, in, for the fact that we run 90 plus billion dollars. It's a fairly small team, uh, you know, to around 20 analysts and PMs included. So we like the cross-pollination from one to the other. We like the fact that somebody covers tech can also look at energy, can also look at China, but also look at European, uh, European industrials. So that brings a very, much more rounded approach to investing. I suppose when you look at the, the last four years in particular, it's been a remarkable moment in economic history in terms of the stimulus that's been brought to the fore either through yep. bank channels, oh, sorry, a big pardon, central bank channels mm -hmm. or government channels. And now all of that's being withdrawn. Uh, how do you calibrate your instruments amidst all of that? So I think, I think the biggest issue we feel we need to look at is, is where we are coming from a longer term perspective. And, and clearly we come post GFC, the amount of stimulus on an ongoing basis, the market would sneeze and there was a stimulus given yeah. and more stimulus given. And then finally we had COVID. I think we are the other side of the mountain. And our, our view is that the playbook that worked very well post GFC, you gotta change that playbook. There's a new movie playing, which is called five possibly six percent interest rates yep and we got to adapt to that so that's been uh, one of your uh, th founding theses in in the last couple of months in particular that you're getting used to interest rates and bond yields being higher for, for, for longer mm -hmm. so uh, under those circumstances I, i've noticed that in your portfolio orientation you're quite uh underweight the consumer discretionary side of things mm -hmm. but but um and you're more overweight in the energy space. Um, but interestingly, you're quite underweight the US relative to emerging markets, for example. So I'm just curious as to what the rationale behind that sort of portfolio uh, positioning is. So we feel that a lot of the emerging markets have actually behaved much better than some of the developed markets because there has been no free money, no quantitative easing, interest rates are high. So let me give you an example. If you look at Brazil, interest rates are touching almost 14%. Inflation is lower than Europe, while Europe interest rates are still 3% handle. Uh, so we feel that a lot of emerging markets are coming out of a long trough uh, where the you know, banking system had issues and so forth, which is normal cycle. Yep. Um, the obviously opportunities in the US still, mostly outside of tech. We're very concerned about the consumer discretionary technology areas because there are a lot of over-earning. Let's not forget that how much stimulus was spent on buying IT stuff by everybody. Yep. So there will be a hangover and we're still going through that hangover in that area. And uh, interestingly, you mentioned Brazil, but um, you've also spoken about your 
uh, caution in relation to China. So uh, because of the political risk there. So you've kind of missed out on a, quite a substantial rally in the Chinese markets from the end of last year to where we are now. Um, how do you contextualize all of that in relation to the China reopening and, and um, all of the focus on China at the moment, given that they're almost expected to be the cavalry in some respects to come and rescue the world economy from the growth picture? Well, our view is if you're bullish on China by Brazil. Right, okay. Because, because they sell everything China wants. Now, the problem in China is that we are bullish on the economy. However, the Chinese government's intervention has become very, very heavy-handed. And we've seen a lot of examples. I mean, a few years ago, it was Macau, then education companies, then, then e-commerce and tech and healthcare and toll roads over the years. And we feel that the minority shareholders may be more vulnerable to poor returns right. than is appreciated. Because China is one of those markets where the large country GDP growth always sort of acts as, 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 as a massive magnet. Problem is the shareholders have not been well served. I'll give you one data point. If you look at the last 20 plus years, China has grown tremendously, but it has been hardly the returns have been mid single digits in dollar terms. So you've actually not been served well as a shareholder. So that um, I'm interested in, in that because you've spoken about uh, Chinese companies almost being a proxy state owned enterprise, and that's why you have such low returns because they're emulating a government. Uh, uh, instrumentality in some respects. So, uh, the is that the entire reason for giving China a bit of a cold shoulder at the moment? But because the biggest component of the Chinese indices are really some of the tech e-commerce names, and the private sector in general is is really under tremendous pressure. I mean, not just Baba, Alibaba, and Tencent, where they now the government has a golden share. Yeah. Uh, so I think I think there's a significant part of the Chinese economy where uh, where private enterprise are struggling to generate profits for because they're basically being used as as a vehicle for national service. Yep. So the Chinese household savings rate is actually very high mm -hmm. at the moment and it's been stubbornly high obviously because of the pandemic. But are you not concerned about missing out on that trade when that um, savings rate comes down and um, all of the possibilities that brings with it as far as the um, Chinese consumer facing stocks are concerned? So let me ask you this, would you spend more money because you have more money in the bank account? Yeah, look, it's a good, it's a good point. <laughs> but most of th th that's my concern about China is that the, the the common consensus is that they've saved so much money they will be spending more. Yeah, we actually believe the opposite because for last three years there've been such a bombardment of uh, caution from the government that COVID is so dangerous. This job insecurity because the best paying jobs in technology and service industries have seen a lot of job losses. In an People spend money when they feel secure about their future. Yep. When they're insecure and are coming out of COVID, we believe the savings rate could be actually higher for longer. Right. Uh, and, and that means that, the, uh, that, that this, the, the highest savings rate, having sort of jump-started the economy, it will probably won't happen this time. The government will spend money, which they are, yep. but they're spending more on you know, infrastructure, property, and so on and so forth. Because let's not forget, unlike US and a lot of parts of the Western world, in US, they literally send checks in the mail. Yeah. Chinese government is not sending checks in the mail. They're simply saying, okay, we'll lend you money if you need to, if you yep. need to borrow. That's very different. Now, um, the other um, thing about your, uh, perhaps, uh, not your relative position in relation to the US, how much has that got to do with the dollar trade? Because um, US dollar has been incredibly strong um, over the course of the last couple of years. Um, do you feel that being exposed to EM markets uh, is a good time um, now because of the potential for the US dollar to come back? No, I mean, it, it's actually much more bottom-up story. So if you look at what we like in US, it's much more on healthcare, utilities, energy, we're still very bullish on energy. That's one area we're very bullish on. And emerging markets, some of the countries uh, are again driven by bottom-up, which is driving this. It's less of a dollar issue because, look, who knows where dollar is going and it's hard to sort of make money out of those kind of things. Now, uh, obviously, India gets spoken about in a whole range of issues, uh, in a range of contexts, but um, you have um, looked at a situation which has been uh, quite interesting of late in relation to how much of your portfolio you've in invested in um, some of Adani's assets. Um, I'm interested in this purely from the perspective in terms of managing risk, um, getting in at a, a reasonable level because there was a lot of hyperventilation about the potential for um, this group of companies being a systemic risk 
um, to the Indian economy because of its embeddedness within uh, that picture. Um, energy assets, infrastructure assets, um, you've obviously seen them as being quite attractive. Um, I'm just interested in your process for, for working all of that out given the hysteria around this conversation in the last couple of months. Yeah, as you write, there's really is hysteria because uh, there's been a lot talked about, but nobody, I've not, at least I have not seen anybody talk about what are the underlying assets you're talking about. So we have a little bit of sort of uh, story to tell how we, you know, how we think about these things. As you know, we have a group of former investigative journalists, and we talked to a lot of former employers, former regulators who actually regulated Adani. We talked to bankers, their current partners, their former partners, their former general counsel. And, and we talked to a whole host of names, and what we found was there are no signs of fraud. In fact, they are very good in execution in India, which is a difficult country to do business in, yep. right? And the assets are quite remarkable. I mean, talk about Mumbai Airport. Well, you can't replace that, that asset. Yep. Um, the best port, in fact, 25% of India's air traffic volume goes, passenger traffic goes through their airports. They have 50% share of top 10 routes in the country. 30% of India's cargo volume goes through their ports. And these guys, have executed remarkably. In fact, as you know, they also got the, uh, the, 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 the biggest port in Israel as the concession for that. Obviously, I'm sure Israeli government did some, did some due diligence of that. So you're buying some really remarkable as infrastructure assets for very attractive prices. And I think, I think there's an issue of virtue signaling these days. Yeah. There's, a, there's not enough substance, but it kind of looks maybe bad on a PR perspective. And we feel our job as a fiduciary, we owe it to our clients uh, and, and then over the long run, we deliver good returns and when they're attractive assets. So when we talk to this sort of non-traditional work, uh, we thought that, you know, they're, they're very attractive uh, assets to own, but we have to handicap in terms of size. So they are relatively small size. Uh, so even if you're wrong, you know, it'll be bad quarter, not a bad year, let alone bad five years. Indeed. So, I mean, I suppose the interesting thing about that is, um, I know it's a little bit uh, further down the, the track in terms of the investment thesis, but there's so much talk about the geopolitical risk um, in, in the Asia Pacific region at the moment. How much did that feed into your investment decision? So I think the geopolitical risk is increasing China. That's the other reason we're very cautious on China, because if you think about the US, uh, and in general, um, uh, Europe also, there's an increasing risk of sanctioning individual Chinese companies because now China has, has become a true rival. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, if you look at last week, there was a discussion about uh, banning uh, American companies investing in China, right? So this is escalating. We feel India is in that context actually relatively safe haven. Yep. Uh, the second thing is there's a reshoring which is happening away from China into India. Yeah. The third is that if you look at the, the, the reforms that have taken place in the last six, seven years that don't get enough um, sort of day in the sun. I'll give one data point. The amount of road and railway construction that is happening annually now in India is five times, five times greater than what they were doing seven years ago. So infrastructure build out is quite, quite rapid which I think could really sort of, you know, make the business, doing business a lot easier. And we feel that's, that's actually pretty powerful. So um, we've gone from the very long term, I suppose, in terms of geopolitical issues and uh, to more to the shorter term. So we're just seeing an incredible amount of volatility uh, in, mm -hmm. in the market it's at the moment. Uh, what do you need to see to feel uh, more comfortable in relation to the outlook for interest rates and inflation in particular at the moment, given that you know, we all know that inflation can remain quite sticky for, for a longer period of time. Uh, I think on the inflation side, the, the comparables are, are and should be getting easier. So we do feel inflation should start behaving. It probably won't go to 2% handle, but it can definitely come down, which I think should board well you know, once you go beyond, let's say, 6, 9, 12 months. However, we feel that there are parts of market which are being given away. Yep. These are fundamentally sound companies, but they are in kind of messy industries. The problem is these are the products we need. We, you may not want them, but you need them. Yep. In fact, we believe the best way to invest today is invest in areas that you need, yep. even if you don't want them. So energy probably um, fits the bill in terms energy of- Energy fits the bill. So how do you um, make uh, the case in relation to that uh, decarbonization piece and, and you know, investing over the horizon in that respect um, as compared to the moment right now? I think, I think we, we have to make an energy transition. There's no question about it. The problem is 
energy transitions don't happen in two, three years. They take decades. Yep. And, 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 and it'll be hard to get there even in, by 2050, but we have to start the journey somewhere. And all these things are very commodity intensive. So for example, if you look at Adani Coal, right? Adani Coal, the earnings, and by the way, that's only 5% of revenue. They are, they are now the largest green energy company, private sector green energy company in India. So that's an energy transition story. Yep. Because even Germany, by the way, 40% of power generation is coal. And they're actually increasing dependence coal because Russian gas has stopped. So we feel that the, the, the energy transition is important, but that can only happen. We need interim solution. We can't switch it off. If you switch off fossil production today, you're going to get a massive crisis. Yeah. Well, we saw um, hints of that um, over exactly. the course of the last 12 months. Uh, Rajiv, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I wish we had um, some more time, but um, perhaps uh, next visit to Australia, uh, we'll have the opportunity to chat. But thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And thanks very much for joining us for the Executive Series.